And I want to share with you from our laboratory, from other laboratories, from science, six steps to a better memory. Okay? So the step one is to exercise regularly, and Brandon will tell you more about this later. So here are some quick facts. People who are more physically fit have less cognitive decline, greater brain volume, there's just more of it there. They have reduced risk for Alzheimer's disease. And you can start late in life, even now. There's nobody here who's too old to start exercising. And at this point, you can still improve cognitive function, you can improve brain function, and you can improve the volume. Even for someone who has the beginnings of Alzheimer's, okay, you don't want to send them off jogging in the neighborhood, they might not come back. But if you put them on a treadmill, or you walk with them, okay, physical exercise can help reduce that cognitive decline. I'm going to skip that. The hippocampus, our favorite brain region, six months of, of exercise is enough to show some increase. A year of exercise will increase the hippocampus. Big hippocampus is good. People who are physically fit, who have greater aerobic fitness, and you'll hear more about that from Brandon, have bigger hippocampuses. Okay? It, this is the, the best medicine. Okay? So you might ask, well, how does it work? And why is it so powerful? And the answer is, is it's so powerful because it works in so many different ways. There's not just one thing that it does. Okay? It reduces stress. Exercise improves sleep, reduces your risk of stroke, reduces blood sugar, increases the ability of neurons, the cells in the brain, to grow and survive, and improves blood supply to the brain. So there's six different ways, and each of them independently and in parallel is the ways in which exercise is helping to improve brain function. So the general conclusion is exercise has widespread effects on the brain. Even moderate intensity exercise a few days a week will improve mental health. Even starting exercise late in life, if you can't say, oh, I, it's too late, you can do it today. And it should have long-term benefits for it helping brain health. So the lifestyle recommendation number one is get regular aerobic exercise. And aerobic means you're breathing heavy, your heart is pumping. Okay? You have to feel your heart pumping. And you know you're helping not only your heart, but your brain. Now there's a caveat here, okay, which is people say, I'm really into sports. I'm a real sports person. Okay? This is not aerobic exercise. Okay? Sports observation is not sports participation. Tip number two, keep mentally active. Everything that applies to keeping the body physically active applies to keeping the brain physically active. Okay? Cut the risk for Alzheimer's in half if you keep mentally engaged. It does much of the same thing, increases brain volume, reduces shrinkage in the hippocampus. What it does is it creates a cognitive reserve. The more you know, the more you learn, the more brain connections you have, the more resilient you are to some of those things being damaged with age and Alzheimer's. It's literally as you learn new things, synapses, connections in the brain grow, neurons grow. You can actually grow new parts of your brain by learning something new, and we're going to come to that in a little bit. Okay? So lifestyle recommendation number two is stay mentally active. Whether it's Sudoku or chess, you want to use your brain or lose it. And there's some very st scary statistics that each additional hour of TV watched per week increase your risk of Alzheimer's by 30%. Now you might think, well, mother was right. It really is the boob tube. It really does rot your brain. Now it's probably not the case that the, that the rays are, are rotting your brain. What it is is that every hour that you're spending there, sort of slack-jawed, ah, watching TV, okay, is an hour you're not engaging your brain, an hour you're not out there physically active. So excessive TV watching is a marker for lack of physical and mental engagement. So lifestyle recommendation number two is you want to learn something new. And I want to talk a bit about learning, because learning is really how we get the brain active. Just doing something you know over and over again, re re repeating something you know, doesn't really engage the brain, doesn't really grow new neurons. New neurons grow when you learn something new. And so there are several steps to learning. You want to observe somebody else doing something. You want to practice something piece by piece. And then you want to practice with hints. And then you want to rehearse at home. So I'm going to, uh, OK, this is not working here. So do we have, where's the AV? Is this, sorry, is this not working? Sorry, this is not working. Oh, here it goes.
Okay, you all set to learn something new? We're going to learn this new. Uh, by the way, if the AV is here, can we turn up the volume on the music? It's a little bit low, right? A little hard to hear in the back? Yeah, so if our AV people are here, Diane, can we get them to turn up the volume? But before we try to sing, I need some help. I'm not much of a singer, but there are some fabulous singers here. And uh, you all know who you are. I've come around. And uh, so I want to ask my friends from New Hope and some of the other friends to come on up. C come on. We got, we got some of the choir singers. Some singers. Francis Dixon, I know if you come up, I know if you come up, you're going to bring them in Ingrid. Come on up. Come on. We want to get some of our choir singers. Where's this AV guy? He disappeared. OK. Francis. Come on up. All right. Thank you so much. Where's the AV guy? OK. I want, no. You can get on the stage, too. We got, we got, you, you, well, we have to, we have to do it here. You got, you guys can come up here, stage too. Come on back, come on back here. So, from any choir at all, from any choir at all, and uh, we're going to learn, we're going to learn, we're going to grow new brain, we're going to grow new brain cells here. Come on around. Now, maybe a little hard to see the lyrics here. That's going to be a little bit of a problem. So, okay. Okay. So, oh, so you guys all come on in close. Okay. okay. Thanks for so, we're going to all say it together. Getting close. Okay. Let, let's, we're going to do it first by just speaking it aloud. Thanks for the memories. We're just going to say it first, then we'll go through it. Thanks for the memories. Thanks of, for the memories. Of rainy afternoons. Of rainy afternoons. Swinging Harlem tunes. Swinging Harlem tunes. Of motor trips and burning lips and burning toast and prunes. Oh, and burning lips and burning lips. Burning lips. How lovely it was. How lovely it was. Okay, let's just stick with that one first verse. Okay, you ready? So now, let's see this here. Ready? We'll sing. Now we're all going to sing along. Thanks for the memories of rainy afternoons, swinging Harlem tunes, of motor trips and burning lips and burning toast and tunes. How lovely it was. Thanks for the memories of candlelight and wine, castles on the Rhine, of Parthenon and moments on the Wilson River line. How lovely it was. Thank you. You've all learned something new. <laughs> You've all. Thank you all. That was short. Short and sweet. Thank you. So for those of you who've just learned those two verses, you have grown new neural connections. OK? New neural connections are what you want to do. And whether it's learning a new song or learning a new dance, that's going to keep your brain alive. So let me talk about number three. Tip number three is avoid unproductive stress. OK? Any Star Trek fans here? Yeah? OK. So I want you to imagine that it's back in the 60s, and Captain Kirk is the captain of the Starship Enterprise. And he has to decide how to respond to a Klingon attack. OK? So Kirk does three things. He sends three orders down. He says, release all unnecessary cargo. OK, dump it into space, because we need to be light and nimble. Kirk says, shut down all unessential systems, cooking, repair, lights. None of these things are necessary for the fight against the Klingons. And finally, he tells down to Scotty in the engine room, Scotty, give me warp factor 7. OK, you want to gun the engines as fast as you can to escape. So this is how you escape from the Klingons. Now, what does this have to do with stress? Well. Scotty warns Captain Kirk. He says, but Captain, he says, the dilithium crystals, they cannot take the strain. And Kirk says, well, damn the dilithium crystals. We have to escape from the Klingons. So what Kirk is doing is he's making a decision here. He's saying, yes, going up to warp speed is going to cause some damage. But if the Klingons blow us to pieces, it doesn't matter what happens to the, to the engine. 
So it's, you take, you, you take a, a trade-off. You're willing to damage some of these, uh, these parts of your system in order to escape and survive for another day. And that's the trade-off that happens with stress. So your body's stress response is similar. It wasn't designed necessarily for Klingons, but it was designed for this. Okay, saber-toothed tigers. Now it's been a long time since they've been seen on Raymond Boulevard. Okay, but your body is still primed and your brain is still primed as if there were saber-toothed tigers on Raymond Boulevard. So when you get stressed, your body is, does exactly what it should do if you came across a saber-toothed tiger on Raymond Boulevard. You void all unnecessary cargo. Okay? Two, you shut down all non-essential systems. Immune, menstrual cycles, sleep, all these things aren't essential to escaping from the tiger. And lastly, you ramp up the brain to warp speed. Okay? Your brain becomes incredibly fast and incredibly focused because you have to get away from the uh, tiger. And all these things are good. You get faster brain and body responses. You get focused attention. The whole world focuses. Your whole brain focuses on this tiger. And you get increased alertness. You're incredible, you're hearing your vision. Okay? All of that is fabulous to allow you to survive the next five minutes. But there's a cost. And just like on the Starship Enterprise, the cost is damaging the dilithium crystals in Scotty's engine. The cost is that stress hormones set the body and brain to warp drive, but they're toxic to the hippocampus, our key brain region for memory. Stress releases a hormone called cortisol, which is the hormone that stops new neurons from growing. So all that fun we had, all those new neurons that uh, we grew when we were singing that old Bob Hope song, that's all been undone by stress. Stress is going to stop that from happening. Stress decreases the hippocampus. And women especially are particularly vulnerable to the effects of stress on the brain because of interactions with estrogen and other reproductive hormones. So lifestyle recommendation three is be aware of how you react to stress. Avoid counterproductive stress reactions. Okay, if it's not a saber-toothed tiger, if it's not an 18-wheeler coming down the road at you, it's probably not a stress situation, a situation where stress is good. Exercise and sleep, which we talk about, are both really important. If you don't get enough exercise, you don't get enough sleep, your body can't deal with the stress, can't distinguish between productive and unproductive stress. So when unproductive stress begins, when you're stuck in traffic on the Garden State Parkway, okay, or when you call your broker and he tells you what your retirement fund is doing, okay? Now, that's the time when you might start to get stressed, but that stress isn't going to help you. So you want to think about it as that stress reaction is building. Think about Scotty down in the engine room saying, but Kirk, the hippocampal neurons, they cannot take the strain, okay? Be good to your hippocampal neurons and they'll be good to you. Get a good night's sleep. We've mentioned this a few times. Well, let me tell you why it's so important. Okay, let's talk about sleep again from the point of view of an example, from a metaphor. We have a number of people here who like to go shopping, right? You go out shopping, you have a busy day of shopping, you come back, you look like this shopaholic with all the bags in hand, and there are a couple of things that you need to do. You need to review and organize what you did for day's shopping. What did you buy, okay? You need to discard the excess, the paper, the wrapping, the bags, okay? And then you need to take all these fabulous things that you bought and you need to put the shoes in the shoe box and you need to put the dresses hanging in the closet. Okay? And when you're done with all that, okay, you've reviewed it, you've discarded the excess, you've put away your things, you're ready to go out shopping again. Okay? So sleep is very much like what happens when you come back from a day of shopping. Sleep is where the brain reviews and organizes what's happened during the day. It's where the stuff that isn't important, the unessential things, get discarded. And it's part of a dialogue. There's a conversation that goes on between the hippocampus, which is that little structure down there, the little yellow structure in the middle, and the rest of the brain, which is where things are stored. And there's a dialogue back and forth where the things that the hippocampus has brought into the gateway are sent out and put where they should be. And if you don't sleep, then all the new things that you learned, all those fabulous lyrics to the Bob Hope song, if you don't sleep, they're gone tomorrow. You need to sleep. You need to what's called consolidate that memory with sleep so it becomes permanent. So storing the memories to cortex, to the long-term memory stores is critical. So let me summarize. Sleep is essential for stabilizing, organizing, optimizing, and keeping permanent your memories. 
They, it, it enables a dialogue between the hippocampus, the gateway, and the long-term memory storage. Sleep disruption is common in aging and disease, and it's one of the reasons why you often see memory impairments. And even a short nap, an afternoon nap, it can be helpful for beginning to consolidate some of those memories, for freeing up the hippocampus to learn new things. So recommendation number four is sleep more both at night and if you can, take naps during the day. So five, socialize with others. Everybody here gets an A plus from Rutgers for socializing because you're all here with your friends and your community co partners. So living alone doubles the risk for dementia and Alzheimer's. Living alone later in life can triple the risk. Animal studies confirm that, the, that mice that are exposed to other mice have less of these plaques in their brain. And why? Why are other people good for us? Well, it's as long as they don't cause us stress. Okay, that could be the other way around. But, so you want to be with people who don't cause you stress um, and who promote good lifestyles. But it's the social and intellectual stimulation. It's coming out. It's interacting with people. It's talking with them. It's, it's having a conversation. Um, all of that helps keep your mind alive. So I'm very lucky. I have some fabulous friends here in the community. Um, these are just a few of them. You may recognize yourselves. So all of you, both up here in the photo and the rest of you out here, you're part of what keeps my brain healthy and young. Thank you. Friends? We met at nine. We met at eight. I was on time. No, you were late. Yes, I remember it well. We dined with friends. We dined alone. A pair of sand. A pair of two. Yes, I remember it well. So your friends can serve many roles. Partly they can help fill in the gaps, the things you don't remember, and they can reassure you that you're still young at heart. So the last bit of advice, one which will sort of set at the stage for uh, later on we have lunch, is to eat light and healthy. Your diet is a critical part of brain health, and Margaret Camarari will tell you a bit more about that later. So you want to manage body weight. Obesity is one of the, the, the big risk factors for brain, brain damage, for Alzheimer's. You want to avoid saturated fats and high cholesterol foods. You want to eat brain protective foods, dark fruits, vegetables, cold water fish like salmon and tuna, and lots of nuts. So these are the kind of the diet, some of it's often called a Mediterranean diet, which can help you keep your brain healthy. So that's a little bit of a brain healthy diet. So now you're at Rutgers, you've come back to school, and one of the things that you remember from school, perhaps associated with a little bit of stress, were final exams. So we're going to have a little bit of a final exam here before I wrap up. So I'm going to go through and see. I'm going to give you a hint, and you see how many of these six you remember. OK, can you remember all six in order? OK, so one is exercise. Two is? Keep mentally active. Three, avoid unproductive stress. If there's a saber-toothed tiger or something is about to kill you, it's OK to be stressed. Get a good night's sleep. And the last one, almost last. And finally, eat light and healthy. OK. So now people say, I can't possibly remember all six. I have a memory disorder. OK? Too many things to remember to help my memory. So people say, is there one thing I can do? One thing you can do instead. OK? So this comes to the homework assignment. The other thing you remember that was stressful in, in, in college and high school was homework. So here's your homework assignment. What you want to do is you want to go home and do the following. OK? This is the official Rutgers Newark method for memory enhancement and Alzheimer's prevention. You want to have frequent vigorous sex with an intelligent partner. Okay. And you can, you can tell them that Dr. Gluck told you you had to. Because 
Frequent vigorous sex with an intelligent partner is exercise. It reduces stress. It's mentally active if you talk to them before or after. Uh, you're socializing with somebody else. And then afterwards you can roll over and sleep better. So it pretty much covers everything. The only thing it doesn't cover is eating light and healthy. Uh, but we're going to come to that later. So that brings me to the end of how Rutgers Newark is going to help you improve your brain health. And for those of you who'd like to find out a little bit more about the brain research and the brain health programs, um, I invite you to come visit our website at www.memory.rutgers.edu. So that's it. Thank you all very much.